welcome. You all should know my voice by now. Um, this is Carol Bershad at University of Washington, and I want to welcome you to the fourth of our six uh, functional trainings for the enrollment module. And this training is all about programs and program offerings. Um, so the this this training is going to be okay. This training is going to be a little different, I think, content-wise than some of our previous trainings for several reasons. And, um, and Steve will probably talk a little bit more about it. But um, we don't have, given the nature of the a and work and sort of a lot of the ambiguity around programs, we don't have as much in terms of service work and in terms of wireframe specifics to show you. So this will be a little bit more conceptually oriented to sort of backtrack and talk in more detail about the types of programs we support at the canonical level um, so that you can really understand when we talk about program offering what it is we're talking about. Um, the other thing that's a little bit different than in talking about courses is really when we've, when we've considered courses from an enrollment perspective, we really have been thinking about courses as sort of a monolith, like there's one type of course, typically a credit course. Um, when we talk about programs, we really have to start thinking about all the different types of programs. You have everything from a minor to a major to a baccalaureate to a PhD. You know, all these things are, are what we consider programs. So it's not, it gets a little bit more complicated. We can't just talk about programs as, as sort of a, a, um, as a single entity. We have to kind of consider all the different flavors of programs. So that's where the, we're, this training is going to be a little bit different than perhaps what you've seen in the past. Um, my very capable um, SME and BAs for this training um, are both from USC. It's Steve Barnhart, who will talk about program and program offering, and uh, Mike Wynn, who will talk about um, enrolling in programs and um, program assessments. Um, as always, Cheryl is your logistics coordinator, and today Hugh Parker from UW is going to be the critical observer. Um, and you can find more information, as always, on the wiki for our training. Okay, so uh, just to orient you, um, uh, the functional areas that we're dealing with in this training. You know, we, we've done we've done set the outer circle in the first train or the second training rather. We did set up, we did people in permissions. Um, in the third training, we moved to the core circle and we covered course registration, course offering, course registration, course assessment. And now we're moving to this middle circle that we're, so we're going to consider program offerings, and we necessarily have to back up a little bit into curriculum management and understand programs at the canonical level before we can really understand program offerings. But we're going to look at um, how programs are offered, um, how students enroll in programs, and then how um, program assessment happens. So that's just a little context setting for you. Um, as always, our overall objective for these trainings is just to give you an understanding of our functional framework and an understanding of the artifacts as they currently exist. Um, and for this object or this module in particular, the objectives are to give you an in-depth understanding of the three functional areas that I just identified: program offering, program enrollment, and program assessment, and how these things intersect with curriculum on one side and degree audit on the other. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Steve Barnhart from USC, who will uh, walk you through programs and program offerings. And I'm going to go on mute. So, thank you, Steve. All right. Is everyone good with uh, seeing the slides? Yes. Yep. OK. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk uh, yeah, about programs, program offerings, program enrollment, and program assessment. I'm going to take the first two large categories there. And within the context of program, we're first going to talk about types of programs. Then we'll move on to requirements and canonical program attributes. So we'll get started with that now. As, as Carol mentioned, uh, there isn't a lot of services design, and certainly um, a, a paucity of any type of wireframes uh, surrounding these things. Uh, we're still mixing the ingredients on this, so we haven't. It's not even half baked at this point. Uh, we haven't we haven't put them all in the oven yet and gotten started. Um, so this is gleaning out of requirements and going back, as Carol mentioned, to uh, curriculum management. We're going to take a look at some of those curriculum management issues 
but from the standpoint of what exactly is a program, not how do they get created, not what is workflow, but what are the components of, of a program. So at a very basic level, a program is a prescribed set of learning activities, and those learning activities may include courses, activities, learning objectives, competencies, projects, experiences, any of that. Um, in addition, the program leads to some form of acknowledgement of successful completion. Uh, that can be a degree, it can be a certificate, or it can just be a, a non-physical document acknowledgement of um, the completion of the program. <clears throat> This slide on the program logical relationship is, is um, important to understand, so I'll, I'll stop at the end of discussing it and ask specifically for questions here. As Karen said, as Carol said, not Karen, um, programs are not monoliths the way courses were. So any given student may have a multiple um, set of programs to which they're attached to accomplish one thing. And we use here the example of a baccalaureate credential. And so a baccalaureate credential um, is the baccalaureate degree. It, in turn, will have a general education core or breadth requirement, most likely. There will be one or more major disciplines attached to it, or specialization as a variation of a discipline. Um, in the Canadian context, um, we're treating the specialist degree as requiring what a, an uber or super major. It may but does not require a minor, and it may have some um, form of honors attached to it. But once again, those two are not required. From those definitions, there is a set of program requirements, which can be considered rules. We divide them into three separate categories. They are entrance rules, which we'll talk about in more detail later, satisfactory progress rules, and completion rules. And it is possible that each one of those blue boxes on the left will have its own set of those three rules. On the other side of the rules are the courses that the students take in the red boxes and the results of their taking courses, things such as GPAs, their standing, uh, their total number of units or credits that they're taken. And those will interact with the rules to determine all those um, entrance uh, satis uh, ability, satisfactory progress, and completion. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions. Wow, it's that clear, okay. Unless someone's on mute. Okay, moving, moving to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about credential programs, give, give some examples. So most fundamental that we're dealing with at the moment is a baccalaureate degree. Um, and it's undergraduate curriculum leading to the baccalaureate degree, and there's some examples of those there. Comprised of one or more major programs, a core general education program, and zero or more minors. A master's credential program is a postgraduate academic program focused on a particular field of study with the goal of attaining an advanced level of expertise in that field. Um, most of those uh, programs requires a, require a thesis or a comprehensive examination to complete. They're different from a baccalaureate program in that you are not admitted to a master's program and pick a major. Um, you are typically admitted to the master's in the discipline program. So that's, that's a distinction between the master's program and a baccalaureate program. Doctoral program is a postgraduate academic program representing the highest level of study within a field, so it's a term, considered a terminal degree. Um, it typically requires a strong research focus, particularly for PhD programs, and requires, it culminates with a written dissertation. We also support a credential program of professional, and typically we're handling these at the graduate level, although some schools uh, consider some of their baccalaureate programs to be professional programs. And it's an academic program uh, designed to equip students for employment in specific fields, such as law, medicine, business, architecture, et cetera. And as it's there, as I mentioned before, they, they can exist at both the undergraduate and graduate level, although for our purposes, they're typically at the graduate level. 
Okay, moving, moving below the uh, credential program, uh, we have a core or what we tend to think of a breadth or general education uh, program type, and it's an organization of courses required for a foundation of general knowledge. Um, typically, it's at the undergraduate level where we think of that, but it is possible at the graduate level uh, to consider like a first-year law student all take the same general education classes and then branch out into their electives. So it can be handled that way, although it need not be. Um, the undergraduate core may differ between degrees of the same type, for example, a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science at the same institution um, in, in different faculties or schools. Uh, for example, at USC, it used to be that the Bachelor of Science within the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences had a different writing requirement and a couple other course requirements that were different than, say, the Bachelor of Science offered through the faculty or school of engineering. Next type of program we consider a rubric of academic programs. And this includes majors, which is an organized curriculum in a particular discipline, is, um, discipline in a baccalaureate program, which provides both depth and breadth in the area of study. Minors are smaller versions of majors for all intents and purposes, so it's another organized curriculum which may be taken, may be taken but not required as part of a baccalaureate program, and it typically has fewer credit hour requirements than, than a major does. So it's, it's not as deep and usually not as broad. Within um, majors, we have uh, specializations, which are variations of a major program that lead to specific educational or occupational goals. Uh, we, we, uh, may represent a portion of unique curricula or a more focused path of study within a major area of study. For example, at USC, we grant at the bachelor's level a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Um, and that is the only undergraduate business degree. Within that degree, students can specialize in marketing, information systems, um, organizational behavior, accounting, things like that. So I want to give a couple samples of what a bachelor's program may look like. In the U.S. Virgin, version, you would, have, you would have the baccalaureate program itself which may have a unit count, say 128 units, and an overall GPA of 2.0. Um, we have a core general education requirement, which may have a, certainly has its own courses attached to it, may also have a GPA requirement, may also have a unit requirement. You'd have one or more majors. Within each major, you may have zero or one specialization. And then you may have an optional minor, zero or more. And there are typically rules about co combining minors and majors at the institution, so that you can't minor in a discipline closely related to your major. For our Canadian colleagues, the Canadian version, uh, the baccalaureate degree with the core breadth requirement, um, and these are just examples. It's not e exhaustive. Uh, you have, may have your specialist field or super major or you may have two majors, or you have, may have one major and two minors, or three minors, or any other combination that you allow. But each line there, each bulleted point there would be a, a program assembled together. So I'll stop there before we go on to requirements and ask for questions. Yeah, I have a question from U of T. Uh-huh. Um, I'm uh, thinking about engineering where our uh, degree is more of, I think, what I've seen as a phase lockstep from your terminology. And you've gone into some detail about how a bachelor baccalaureate degree is structured internally. I'm wondering if there's more information about what you envisage for professional. Is it not the same as a baccalaureate or is it just a different label on a similar thing? It is slightly different at the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, it probably would not be any different. But at the graduate level, um, there are some subtle differences between a professional degree um, as far as whether it requires a dissertation or thesis. Typically, um, they do not. 
um, and that's a distinction from like a PhD program versus a doctor in musical arts, for example, where they will have to, um, if they're a performance major, um, put together several recitals and things like that. But at the graduate level, remember, it's, it's typically monolithic at the graduate level of any sort, that you're admitted into the PhD in mathematics program or the PhD in applied mathematics program. So the, the ability to have variation and discretion underneath that is more limited at the, any graduate level, including the, most especially the professional degrees. So is a professional degree intended to be only graduate level then? Because in our case, I'm talking about undergraduate engineering. No, it need not be. Most, most schools continue to consider all the baccalaureates to just be baccalaureates, but um, as we mentioned earlier on one of the slides, that it may, a uh, professional degree may exist at the undergraduate level as well. Thank you. We, we have another question regarding the specializations. I noted that it said you can only have zero or one specialization within a major. Is there a reason why it's limited to one and you couldn't have multiples? At, at BC, there's a concept of a concentration, which really isn't a minor. It's, um, a con it's, a, it's related to the major, but you could have more than one. You know, we haven't had that surface yet in our requirements, so we'll have to go back and look, because we, at this point, it has been once you pick you choose a specialization from a major. Okay, and you have requirements that are related specifically to that specialization then? That's correct. Okay, yeah, I mean, just at BC, there's this concept of concentrations. They're not really minors because they are directly related to the major. So in addition um, to the major. Kind of in addition like to English, the English plus creative writing. Yeah. Right. We, at, at different institutions, the, you know, sometimes it's called a concentration, sometimes it's a track, sometimes it's a specialization, sometimes it's a pathway. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Carol. I think with program in particular, we're going to run into a lot of just naming conventions and terminology issues. So I think it's sometimes a matter of winding up conceptually what you're thinking of as a specialization or a minor or a pathway with with our structure and see if it fits in. Because uh, it could just be a terminology in some cases. We'll have to suss out whether it's terminology or it's actual structure, conceptual design differences. Yeah, because I think about a minor being more something that you pursue potentially independent of the major, but a specialization is something directly related within that major, you're specializing in something. And it's just an issue that you can specialize in more than one thing here as opposed to only with, one. Yeah. Okay. okay, we'll bring that. We'll bring that up. We need to have multiple specializations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else on definition of programs? All right. We'll move on now to talk about program requirements. As we mentioned before, uh, there are three types of program requirements. There are entrance requirements, satisfactory progress requirements, and completion requirements. So entrance requirements typically are rules governing whether or not a student may be added or associated to the program, admitted to different ter whatever terminology you use in a, at whatever level you do that at. At USC, the baccalaureate level, we actually admit uh, directly to major programs. Um, so ours are uh, associated at the point of admission or change of major. Other institutions will admit to the credential program and later move um, the students in to their association with the, with the major program. So you could have the rules set at any level. For undergraduate programs, they may, the rules may differ if being admitted from a high school or transfer institution. For example, at USC, we have very, in some disciplines, we uh, stipulate high school GPAs that may be required in certain minimal courses that they will have to have taken in high school um, if they're being admitted directly from high school. However, if they're being admitted from a transfer institution, we don't look at the high school information, we look at their college work, and if they're a change of major at the institution, the rules may be different. Satisfactory progress. 
requirements. So satisfactory progress is a definition of what constitutes good standing as the student moves through the particular program. And once again, that program could be the baccalaureate program, could be the core program, could be their major specialization or minor programs. All of those uh, program levels and types will have satisfactory progress uh, determined on them. So it's our little bunny um, hopping over its hurdles there. It typically will include the institutional requirements, which can be very general, and more specific course-based requirements. So the institutional requirements will be you have to complete X number of units by a certain time. You may have to have a certain um, overall GPA. Others may be that you have to have completed this particular course by this particular time. <laughs> Is there a vision of anything between the institution and the course for these requirements? Like my program or my department has a certain set or satisfactory progress uh, constructs? Typically, we're hoping that those satisfactory um, progress constructs are inside the program definition. So yes, they will, they will be able to have a variety of things in there. Um, it's all rules-based so that if you can define the data that's being used, um, to make the evaluation and can express it um, in a rule, it should be able to exist as a satisfactory progress requirement. Thank you. Completion requirements. Um, these are detailed academic, and we stress academic conditions which must be satisfied by a student to be awarded the program credential. So it will involve things such as courses, sequences of courses, GPAs, unit counts, um, things like that. We distinguish this specifically from graduation clearance conditions, which may be that you have to turn in um, all of your um, instruments if you're in the dental <laughs> sorts of things. We're not treating that as a completion requirement. We're treating that as a graduation clearance requirement. Questions on that? Okay. Um, as we complete our discussion of program, we're going to move on to our canonical program attributes. So these are at a very high level, not the details, but the categories of, um, of data regarding canonical programs. They include program titles of various sorts, beginning and ending terms and durations, which may include when the program first started, when it's ending, the last term that you can admit people, the last term that they can complete the program, all of those things. Campuses on which the um, program is offered. The delivery method, whether it's online or in person, a combination thereof or other delivery methods. Their entrance requirements, their progress requirements. Once again, completion requirements that we just discussed. Any form of governance in the uh, learning activities that are part of that definition of the canonical program, and any forms of accreditation and classification of the program. Now, on this slide, the items that are uh, in italics are those which may be changed um, at the offering level, which we're about to get into. So some of the things, completion requirements typically do not change. Uh, the governance, the learning objectives, any form of accreditation or classification of the program, those don't change at the offering level. We've got that. We're going to move on to 